By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are looking at a game between my mono green Enchantress deck and I'm taking on a Tron black deck. So before we start with the actual game, let's take a quick look at both decks. The deck that I am playing with today is a mono green deck and it is completely revised. So it only has cards from the revised expansion and it is based on the Fajuran Enchantress. Now Fajuran Enchantress is a 0-2 creature and every time I cast an enchantment, I can draw a card. So what I want to do is basically use green ramp, ramp such as Lunawer Elves and Wild Grove and use that to get mana advantage, use my Fajuran Enchantress to draw a lot of cards. I mean, my deck is full with enchantments, uh, Aspect of Wolves, uh, Lures, I mean, you name it and I've got it. So it's going to help me to draw a ton of cards. Then I'm simply going to use the green ramp to get those big boys out, for instance, Force of Nature. Then I'll put a lure on Force of Nature or even my Thicket Basilisk and I'm just gonna attack, attack, attack. So it's a very basic, um, game, I just want to get big green creatures out and kill my opponent. My opponent, Tronny Tryhard, <laughs> these names, uh, is playing Black Tron today. Tron means that um, you're playing with the Urza Lands, and if you have all three Urza Lands, you have Tron, that's how uh, people call it. And what happens is, usually these Tron Lands only produce one mana. But when you have the tower, the mine, and the plant, something magical happens. All of a sudden, the plant produces two mana, the mine produces two, and the tower even produces three mana. So that's great. So he can use it to cast uh, expensive spells, such as Triskelion, but he can also use it to pump up his Dragon Engine. You can see Dragon Engine in his deck. Also, he's playing with Carrier Ants, so he can use Carrier Ants. Um, so he, he has some tricks up his sleeve. It looks like a very original deck when I'm looking at this list. And what I also notice is those cards there in the middle, and that's called Parfait. And what it means is that you play with four Relic Barriers, and you can use those Relic Barriers to tap your Howling Mine or Winter Orb, because when you do that, the artifacts get deactivated. So in the case of a Howling Mine, when you play it out, your opponent usually has the first advantage. He or she draws an extra card for the first time before you get to draw your extra cards. So this is not great. But when you tap it before your opponent's draw step with, um, uh, with the Relic Barrier, then the Howling Mind's ability um, isn't, uh, the Howling Mind is deactivated. That's what I'm trying to say. And you also have the Winter Orb. And the Winter Orb says that you can only untap one land during your untap phase. Now, if you, after you untap phase of your opponent, use the Relic Barrier to tap the Winter Orb, the Winter Orb doesn't work anymore. So that means that you get to untap all your lands, but your opponent only gets to untap one land each time. And you also see their uh, Gremlins. I believe they're called Phyrexian Gremlins. Very cool card. What they can do is also tap an artifact. So they're actually, in a way, copies in this deck of the Relic Barrier. On the other hand, in old school, you see a lot of artifacts. So he's not very lucky with my deck because I only play with two artifacts, but most uh, old school decks have... I would say like eight artifacts in there at least. So Phyrexian Gremlins can be very useful. Um, when looking at this list, I'm just getting really curious what it's like to play against this deck. I mean, it looks goofy, but I also see a lot of combos. I mean, this could go somewhere. So let's go to game one and see what happens. Game number one is about to begin. And there you go, I'm on the play here, playing a forest into a wild growth. It's a great start for me. That's exactly what I want to do with this deck. There is Trani Tryhard, and that's a pretty good start for him as well. A Swamp into a Soul Ring and a Howling Mine. Does mean that I get to draw two cards, which is great when you're playing green. It's got a lot of small creatures, and look at that, an Elfish Archer. So that's a 2 1 first striker for me. And I'm ready to deal some damage next turn. There's a second Swamp. Tapping four mana. Ooh, wow, look at that. Playing a Royal Assassin and a Brass Man. The Brass Man is a pretty good blocker there. End step, I'm playing a Crumble here over the um, the brass man so probably have a plan here and there's my plan playing a lure so my opponent has to block so the royal assassin is killed by my elvish archer because this is a 2-1 first striker so that's a pretty nice way here to get rid of that royal assassin because that could have been a huge pain for me 
uh, late game. And there's a Relic Barrier, using a Relic Barrier here to tap the Howling Mine. And playing another Brass Man, wow. So maybe he's playing with four Brass Man, who knows. With Trony Tryhard, you never know. It's a weird name, but it's also a very weird deck. So I'm, I'm really curious to see what kind of cards he's going to play. And what can I do now? I've got five mana. And I'm just passing turn. Wow, that's pretty harsh. Just passing turn here. And there is the Urza's Mine. So he's got Urza's Mine, Urza's Power Plant. Just need, needs an Urza's Tower to have Tron active here. But he already has a lot of mana. Wow, and this is a cool card. This card is Xenic Poltergeist. It's also called, referred to uh, as a Mox Killer because what it can do, it taps. It's a 1-1 one, one, and you can tap it and then it can make target artifact into a creature. So target non-creature artifact into a creature. So for instance, the Howling Mine would turn into a 2-2 two, two because um, the creature gets power and toughness equal to its casting cost. Now look at this, I am playing a force of nature, so that's great for me here, and hopefully I get to deal some damage, but my opponent has Tron here with that Earth of Towers. there's a lot of stuff happening here. And he's playing an Ashes to Ashes, oh no, oh, this is bad. I'm losing my entire board. I mean, he needs, he loses five life, but hey, who cares? And those creatures are removed from the game as well, so I cannot use my regrowth. And now he's actually using his Xenic Poltergeist to activate his Howling Mine, to attack with his Howling Mine, and then his Howling Mine is tapped as well. So that's kind of the combo that he's going for, and that's so cool. And look at this, look at what I'm doing. There's so many weird stuff happening here. I'm playing a Living Lance, and Living Lance is uh, making all my forests into 1-1 one -one creatures. So I must be pretty desperate to, to, um, to do that right now. So that means I've got a lot of 1-1 one -one creatures, but they're also land still. And it's only forced, so my opponent um, doesn't have any creatures. It's not like Living Plane. There's a tap. Now remember, this is 7 mana because my opponent has... Oh no, this is horrible. He's playing a Triskelion there. It's horrible. This is a 4-4 four, four creature with 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters. And he can deal a damage with each plus 1 plus 1 counter. So he can actually kill 3 of my lands if he wants to. Now he's using his Scenic Poltergeist to attack me with a 2-2 Howling Mine. Yes, that's exactly what I said. He's attacking me with a 2-2 Howling Mine. And I'm trying to double block, but then he says, well, if you do, I'm going to kill one of your fours. Oh, okay, so I have to block with three, four, four? Okay, whatever, I'll just take the damage. And this is a horrible scenario for me. I guess kind of when I played the Living Lands, I kind of knew, okay, this is not really going to be my game anymore. Because I think my hand's kind of empty as well. And, and here you can kind of see the weakness of a deck that's um, played around a, a, a creature. In, a creature, in this case, the Fujurian Enchantress. When you don't draw your Fujurian Enchantress, it is difficult. I mean, obviously, my deck has some more weapons than just a Fujurian Enchantress, but it helps so much. And now I'm just going for an all-out attack, kind of saying, you know what? It's not going to work. And there you see my opponent killing two of my forces there by taking off two counters from the Triskelion and I'm only able to deal a little bit of damage and I wonder what's gonna happen here so my opponent is now drawing uh, three cards because of those double howling mines that are on the table and I think this first game is done and now he's even using his royal assassin to kill my forests how cool is that and he's attacking me with the Howling Mine. This is pretty cool, right? Using Scenic Poltergeist to attack. And he's playing another Scenic Poltergeist. I mean, I mean, how cool is this deck? It's very original. I only have one forest left. Playing a second forest. So I have two 1-1 one, one creatures here on the board. But I mean, I, there's no way that I can win this first game. So it's just time to, to go to our sideboards here. But let's see. Using both Xenic Poltergeist to activate his Howling Mines. And now look at this interesting army. He's attacking with, with two, two, twos, two, two Howling Mines. I mean, that's never happened. At least not to me. And I get to draw. Playing another forest. And I guess we're just we're, we're playing out the whole game. And I think, I mean, when your opponent is doing cool stuff like this, you have to... 
say, okay, man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you do it. I'm gonna let you have fun here and, uh, and kind of do your thing. And this is really nice, actually, the combination of Xenic Poltergeist and uh, Howling Mind, because you want to get Howling Mind tapped. So if you don't have a Relic Barrier, you can use your Xenic Poltergeist, and you also have a 2-2 creature. So you can, ideally, you can do what he's doing now, and dealing 2 damage with your Howl Howling Minds, and actually get them tapped at the same time. Anyway, I am dead. Well, I was already dead. I think when I played that uh, Living Lance, that, that's just, it wasn't the best move. Um, we're going to go to our sideboards now, and we'll be right back for game number two. Game number two is about to begin. So I have to try to win this one to get a third game, and I would love to get a third game. And what a crazy game one. I mean, I'm just getting punched in the face by a howling mind that's attacking me because of Xenic Poltergeist. I mean, just weird. Very weird. And after that start, I thought, you know, hey, man, he's playing a howling mind. I'm drawing cards. I'm playing mono green here. I I got this. Okay, well, at least another good opening for me here with that Soul Ring. My opponent starting with the Nurse's Tower, playing Lanorel. So I've got a lot of mana going on here, but can I actually do something with it? Second Tower here for Trani, playing the Relic Barrier. So that's the one that you can use to tap artifacts with. And he's using it now to tap my Soul Ring. And I'm playing mana number four and attacking him with my Lanor. This is not great. It's, it looks like I'm kind of missing... I'm not drawing the creatures in the right order, or at least the order that I would like to draw them in, and another Relic Barrier. So my opponent is not doing a lot, so this gives me opportunity here. Tapping five mana, and there is a Cockatrice. That's a 2-4 flying creature, and it kills everything that it is blocked by or blocks itself. And ooh, look at that, playing a Howling, uh, playing a Winter Orb, I mean, and this is not great because he can use that Relic Barrier to tap my Soul Ring. So I just don't have a lot of mana. At least I can deal some damage here. He's going to 16. And remember, because he taps his own Winter Orb, he gets to untap as normal. Playing his Sengir Vampire here. Again, not something you want to see. But I have that Cockatrice. That Cockatrice kills all the creatures that it blocks. And I'm just choosing to attack here. That means that I'm probably willing to take the 4 damage. I do believe I play with Hurricanes in this deck. Ooh, and there's a Royal Assassin. So that can kind of hold off any attacks. And I believe, yeah, he's, he's tapping my Soul Ring again. That's what I wanted to say. And I'm probably not going to attack with the Cockatrice. I am playing a lure. Oh, so I'm doing this again. Attacking with the lure. And this again is a way... I did that in the first game as well. A way to kind of get rid of that Royal Assassin. It does mean that the Sengir Vampire gets a plus one, plus one counter. So it's now a 5-5 five, five flyer. But it doesn't really matter as long as I have the Cockatrice. Because the Cockatrice kind of kills everything it blocks or is blocked by. And look at this. This is a pretty cool card. This is the Hive. And I think it's... Five casting costs, it's an artifact. You can tap it for five, and you know what you get for five mana? You get a single 1-1 one, one flyer. So that's how precious uh, creatures were considered back in the day, creature tokens. Um, but hey, when you have Tron, I don't think my opponent has Tron. I see two power plants and three towers, but when you have Tron, at least you have all the mana you need, and you can kind of dump um, the mana that you have left in your hive and kind of create creatures so it's not too bad and that's exactly what he's doing now he's making a token and I talked about hurricane earlier and hurricane is starting to look really really good with this board especially if he starts to create uh, an army a hive of hive tokens and there's the Phyrexian gremlins it's really hard to see but it's there in the right bottom corner and uh, it's the artifact that we are the the black creature we talked about in the introduction you can tap it to tap target artifact and you can actually keep it tapped and um, it's one of those cards that you just buy because of the art, because it's it's just beautiful, beautiful art. And hey, it's, it's a gremlin. How cool is that? So finally, my Enchantress deck is actually playing a Fujuran Enchantress. That's good to see. So hopefully I can get some enchantments out and do some ramping. What would be really nice now, by the way, is if I could put a lure on the Cockatrice and attack. Attacking now with the 5-5. Blocking the Sengir. And of course, this is what my opponent wants because I'm now making. Um, he's now making space so he can kind of attack. And I'm getting rid here of the Winter Orb. 
So not of the hive, but of the winter orb. So I probably have a plan here. He's, of course, tapping my soul ring again. I'm tapping a lot of mana here. What's... Oh, there is a desert twister on the hive. And my opponent has Tron, by the way. I don't know exactly when it happened, but there's an Urza's Mine there. So when you have Urza's Tower and Urza's Mine and Urza's Power Plant, you have Tron active. And it means an Urza's Tower gives you three mana, Urza's uh, Mine and Power Plant give you two mana. And he's playing a Lord of the Pit. Oh no, this is super cool, but it's a huge problem for me. It's a 7-7 seven, seven Flyer. And the downside of this is you have to sacrifice a creature every turn, but he has those Hive Tokens. And this is good news for me. I'm playing at least some creatures and I've got a Cockatrice. So when he attacks with the Breeding Pit, it does mean that um, I can block with my Cockatrice and kill the Breeding Pit. Now the cool thing is that you could say that Cockatrice and Thicket Basilisk are the first creatures that have Death Touch. But it's actually better than Death Touch because the way it works... Oh no, there's a Natling Imp, sorry. Oh, a Natling Imp that can force me to attack with my Cockatrice. So that's problems for me here. This is great. I'm playing a Hurricane for one. I've been talking about Hurricane all the time. So that means all his Hive Tokens get one damage and they die. And that means that he doesn't have any food for his Lord of the Pit. Wow, what a game is this. There's just so much happening here. Natling Imp dies. Beautiful art of the Natling Imp, by the way. Obviously, he attacks now with his... Lord of the Pit, and I block all my Cockatrice. Lord of the Pit has Trample as well, by the way, so that's why I'm getting some damage here. But it's looking good for me now. And I am playing a Force of Nature. It's a great moment to play a Force of Nature. So let's hope I can keep it alive. And, oh, seriously? Playing a Sorcerer's Queen. So you can use a Sorcerer's Queen, you can tap it. And you can make a creature 0-2. So I'm now using my Regrowth. And I'm putting a lure on my force of nature and attacking here. So that means that he has to be blocked. And actually what we're discussing now, my opponent is saying, Hey man, did you pay for force of nature's upkeep? And I'm like, no, I did not. So I have to take eight damage here. The nice thing about force of nature and also Lord of the Pit is that when you decide not to pay your upkeep cost, it doesn't tap. So you do get damage, but you can still use your force of nature and Lord of the Pit to actually deal damage to your opponent. And it's exactly what you do now. He's on six. And I am on 9. Playing a Sengir Vampire here. Which usually you would say, hey, a Sengir is great. But now with that lure on my Force of Nature, it just means, it just food for the Force of Nature in this case. Playing Aspect of Wolf here. And Aspect of Wolf is a pretty cool card. It gives plus 1, plus 1 for, uh, the two, for 2 Force that you have in play. So you see me counting. I have 8 Force, so it's get plus 4, plus 4. And that's actually the game. Okay, wow. There's just so much happening here. It was very difficult for me to um, to give comments on this game for you. So I hope you could follow it. But it does mean we get a game number 3. How cool is that? I didn't see a single really sideboard card, by the way. So maybe we'll see that in game number 3. Game number 3 is about to start. So let's see who wins this duel here and there is a soul ring turn one into a relic barrier there for 20 tryhard great start but i also have a pretty decent start there with a lot of elves that's really your classic start when you're playing mono green isn't it oh and look at this there's a howling mine and there's a death grip oh no and death grip is too black and it can counter a green spell so this is a huge problem for me because now he can counter Basically everything as long as he has the mana. But for now, I've got a pretty decent turn here with the Elfish Archer and the Wild Grove. Able to ramp a little bit and get a creature in play. But my opponent is simply drawing more cards than me and has that counter spell on a stick. So this is a big problem here. Tapping for two, playing a Winter Orb. I'm only able to untap one land. What can I do? I guess I just have to attack. That's exactly what I do. Dealing three damage, passing turn. But I mean, that death grip is a huge problem. I need to find a way to get rid of that death grip. And look at that. My opponent has so many mana already with that with that soaring out. And I'm just attacking again. I think as long as I can just attack, I'm not really going to play anything. 
Unless, of course, he's tapping out and he gives me the opportunity. So when he doesn't have two black mana, it's kind of like you're playing against blue in this case. And look at that. He's keeping his two black mana open and he's playing a Sengir Vampire. Of course, that that's obvious. And now he's kind of forcing my hand here because if I do nothing, it's going bad. And if I do something, it's probably going to get countered. So there's a Cockatrice and yes, he's using the Death Grip to counter it. And now I'm using a crumble. Oh, so that was my plan. So I wanted the cockatrice to get probably get countered here to use the crumble on the howling mine. Although I wonder if it wouldn't have been better the other way around. Obviously, you want him to get rid of the howling mine because he's drawing an extra card, and eventually that's what is going to give him the game. But I mean, if I don't have something for that Sengir, I also have a problem. So there, there's not an ideal option here. And my opponent here, Tronny Tryhard, has so much mana right now. I mean, he can just keep two black mana open at all times. So he can kind of see how devastating Death Grip can be. Another attack here. So I need a miracle here. And there's another Lanawar Elves. And I'm starting to understand why so many people at least play with one uh, disc when they're playing with a monocolor deck. It's just a disc, just, it's this reset button that can kind of fix everything. And I don't think I'm playing with Tranquility in this deck because I'm playing with so many enchantments myself. Obviously having a um, Fajuran Enchantress deck, although that was hard here to really see in most of the games that I've played. He's attacking me with the Sangir. I'm going down to 12. And my opponent, as you can see, is just keeping those two black mana open. So I guess I'm playing something for the sake of playing something. So he's countering my force of nature. Okay, so I guess this is really me in desperation mode, hoping that he wasn't going to counter the force, thinking I would play something else. I don't really know what, because I mean, what could be more dangerous than a force of nature. And look at that, I'm going to four life here. And of course he's killing my Lanawar else with his Royal Assassin. To be honest, I think this game was, oh, this is cool, Wanderlust. Okay, this is a pretty cool card at least to end this video with. Wanderlust is an enchant creature. You put it on a creature and it deals one damage to its owner. I think it's a pretty cool card. And I don't know if it's underplayed, but I would love to make a deck based on Wanderlust. That would just be great. Um, anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna die here, and I think that the death grip was really the nail in the coffin. Because look at that, it's it's not that bad. I had actually an answer to the Sengir vampires in the form of a hurricane. But anyway, I lost this one. Well done, Tronny Tryhard. Pretty cool deck, man, and um, amazing that death grip. I mean, it was just done for game number three. Um, that's it for now. Thank you for watching uh, this matchup. If you have any comments about the decks, please let me know. So write a reply here below this movie. And please like and subscribe and help the channel grow because I'm hoping to reach a thousand subscribers as, um, as soon as possible. And I believe we're around the 600 uh, subscribers at the moment. For now, thank you for watching. And if you'd like to watch more old school magic, you can click on one of the links that are appearing right now on the screen. Uh, for now, thank you for watching Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And see you next time. <laughs>